Good morning, and welcome to our live broadcast at First Presbyterian. It is a joy to come into your home today with good news about God who loves you. If you're ever in Uptown Columbus, we invite you to stop by and say hello. We'd love to see you, have you worship with us. We'll make you feel like family. At First Presbyterian, we are family. Learning together, growing together, worshiping together. Please stand as you are able for the reading of our first lesson, which comes to us from the Gospel of Luke in the 18th chapter, verses 9 through 14. Listen now for God's word. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. By those who are able to please stand for our second lesson from Isaiah in chapter 6. Listen now to the word of God. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet. And with two they flew, and one called to another and said, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresh thresholds shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, and holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs, the seraph touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. We continue in our year-long journey in the story. And this week, much happens. If you're reading the story, reading that chapter, and as I've said before, there's several ways to approach it when it comes to Sunday and the sermon. Once before, I basically flew at 50,000 feet and gave an overview of the entire chapter and some points from that. Sometimes you come down to 30,000 feet, take a thread from the tapestry and follow it. Well, this week, I'm basically going down to 1,000 feet, taking one small piece of this chapter and focusing on it here in Isaiah. It is an interesting passage that we have heard, and I wonder how Isaiah explained this episode to the Mrs. when he got home. I mean, did he say, uh, honey, uh, a funny thing happened at the temple today? Now, Isaiah 8.3 states that Isaiah's wife was a prophetess. And so she probably did not look at him in a certain way and say, bless your heart, that sounds lovely. Why don't you have a sandwich and a nap? I think that would do you a world of good. She probably listened and took it all in and pondered those things in her heart. But apart from that helpful chat that I suspect he had, how could he explain what had happened to others? The angels sang, and so I guess at best he could say, 
Well, the anthem sure was lovely and let it go at that. But the main point is this. <coughs> Isaiah faced a tough time in his life. Isaiah found himself at a crossroads and Isaiah went to worship and he prayed. Isaiah prayed in the house of the Lord. And when, I, when Isaiah went to pray at a low point in his life, God not only met Isaiah, God met him in a way that ultimately proved to be loving. God comforted and challenged and confronted even and commissioned Isaiah. God gave hope to Isaiah and God gave him a new direction. And so I want to walk through this passage and then make a few observations and reflections. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. That's the key phrase in the year King Uzziah died. The time of great uncertainty in transition. For 52 years, King Uzziah, one of the good guys, uh, was king of Judah, a time of relative military strength and definite economic prosperity. Now, Uzziah made a bad choice towards the end of his life. Uh, he was, kind of, had to have a co-regency. He was put away um, with, with leprosy. And so those last few pages of the chapter are not so bright. But nevertheless, this has been a good era in the history of the people. And now it has come to an end. And now what is next? We have Isaiah here. He is an aristocrat and an advisor to kings. There's some scholarly speculation. He may have even been a cousin to the king. I don't know if second or third or on mama's side or daddy's side. But uh, nevertheless, there's a belief that he may have actually been related to the king. He's clearly part of, the, part of the aristocracy, part of the established families. And he has great entree so that he can go speak to a king. And they may not like what he has to say, but he kind of has a right to be in their presence. He is an advisor, probably, probably also a government official, a bureaucrat, dare we say it. And so with one king dead and a new king on the throne, that's sure there's some questions of job security. What's going to happen in the next chapter ahead? Whether he was at regular worship and prayer or during some special event, we do not know. But we do know that God met him in a very special way. At this time of uncertainty, transition, and waiting, Isaiah prays, and he is praying in the house of the Lord. A time of uncertainty, when the doctor gives you bad news, you pray. In a time of transition, it could be a milestone birthday, an empty nest, a new baby in the mix, you pray. In a time of waiting, what's going to happen next? You pray. Some years ago, friends were gathered. Our friend Brian was talking about the latest in his company. They've been bought out and uh, new management in place and new changes. Uh, some people were going to be let go, some new assignments. For some, really nothing would change. And he said, about two levels up, they've made the changes. And so right now, it's for the guys above me, maybe guys and gals, but those above me are experiencing the changes. And so my level of management, we're just waiting, waiting till they work on us to see what happens. And so in that season of waiting, hey guys, can you pray? Times of uncertainty, transition, and waiting. And Isaiah finds himself in the temple and he beholds the Lord, and he beholds the seraphs. The word comes from the word, root word for burning. It's to guard God's holiness. And they praise God, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then Isaiah sees his own sinfulness and says, Woe is me. I am, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. And yet my eyes have seen the king. He beholds the glory of God. 
and he confesses the light and power of the glory, and he confesses his shortcomings. It reminds me of a story that Ann Graham Lotz, daughter of Billy Graham, shared as she was trying to describe the impact of the glory of the Lord and reflecting on that in, in your life. And once, a television crew wanted to interview Dr. and Mrs. Graham in their home. And so, Ruth Bell Graham got the daughters together and they're cleaning up one side and down the other, getting ready for the television crew. They are dusting, they're mopping, they're putting things in place, they're hiding things in the closet, and for heaven's sakes, don't open that closet door, and getting everything in order, and thought they had done a really good job of getting the house in spick span, spick span fashion to show off. Well, the TV crew got there, they were setting up, they put up some bright lights, but you do need that when you're filming, and all of a sudden, they could see things in the corner. Oop, that cobweb, we didn't quite get out of that corner. Oh, there's a little more dust on that table after all, and more cleaning had to be done. Kind of humorous way of looking at it, but beholding the glory of God, that's what he saw in Isaiah, saw in his own life, his shortcomings. But quickly, the seraph touches his lips with that coal and says, now this coal has touched your lips. Your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. He is given an assurance of pardon. In fact, you may have noticed in our own order of worship today a similar pattern that follows. And that pattern actually literally comes from this chapter of Isaiah. Some churches altered a little bit here and there. But we begin with praise, our hymn of adoration, to get us started. And then we very quickly are called to confess our sins. We confess, but then very quickly again, given that assurance of pardon. Now, in Isaiah's case, it's the offering that comes next. Uh, when um, it's asked as a call for the offering, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah responds, here I am, send me. That's the offering. And then in verse 9, which we did not read, that begins the sermon. We change it a little bit here. Uh, well, the offering will come after the sermon. But you see the basic pattern that is there. I want to make just three observations from this. The first is that in a time of uncertainty and waiting and transition, pray and seek God. Prayer is not something passive. It's not a cop-out activity. At this scary time, Isaiah saw God, and look what happened. So be careful what you pray for. You just might get it. Several of you know of Eugene Peterson. He's a Presbyterian pastor. He wrote the paraphrase of Scripture called The Message. I know many of you all have that, find it very handy as you're reading along in the Bible. He's written many other great books, too. Over 20 years ago, I read a story he told in one of his earliest books, Working the Angles. That story grabbed me. He talked about a Norwegian scholar, a Sigmund Mowinkle. And this gentleman studied and compared the Hebrew prayers found in the Psalms and elsewhere in Scripture with ancient Teutonic prayers. The Teutonic tribes, that's the background for uh, the Germanic tribes, uh, Scandinavians, the Dutch, and through the Angles and the Saxons, also partially ancestors of the English. And in their prayers, he noticed some parallels between those and the Hebrew prayers, and he also looked at the Teutonic customs and realized it must have also happened this way with the Hebrews, and how the community at prayer formed everything that they did. Anything big in these, in these tribal communities among the Teutonic people, it began with prayer, whatever they were going to do next. Many of the, these were written prayers, they were formal prayers, there were like forms that you said every time. And they were a wellspring for the community. It gave them direction and purpose. Talked about standard operating procedures and rules of engagement. A code of honor and a code of conduct. It gave the people hope. A hope from their center that they had. Now granted, these tribes, they were worshiping other gods. But nevertheless, the parallel is there. And what we find in our own Psalms of how it formed the community of the Hebrews and what prayer can be for us. 
that time of centering and focusing and giving you that direction of which way to go. And so in these times of transitions, you pray. Whatever time you find in your life, what college to attend as you fill your uh, folders filled with information, looking at goals and your goals and direction and which school will best match that. A man hits 30, a time of decision making, 28 to 32, critical point in a man's life. It can be a very good thing, realizing mm, my window is narrowing. The decisions I make now will focus, will determine so much more of my life. A nest is emptied, or a nest is emptying with one child away and one or two children at home. Of course, my father always said, it's never truly an empty nest until the last child is off the payroll. Yep, some of y'all can relate to that one. But anyway, as the nest is emptying and transitioning into a new place, a time for prayer. A job loss, or a job promotion, or a job offer. Can, all can bring great uncertainty. A friend of mine in Kansas City several years ago had a great job offer. He was in the insurance business and a company had approached him, but it involved moving to another city. Now his first thought was, well, I'll tell them this is the kind of salary that I need and that'll, they'll say, oh, that's too much and that'll end that one. Well, he gave them a salary figure and they said, okay, we can do that. Now, this would involve, in some respects, a promotion. Another company, but doing more work via promotion. And again, more salary. But it also meant leaving their community and going to another one. And he and his wife you know, said that we're not really sure about the schools, what they are like there. We like what we've got here. We're in a great church community. This is a good place we have for our children. What, what should we do? Well, gang, let's pray. In the end, they decided to stay in uh, the, the metro Kansas City area. But that's what they did at that time of uncertainty. What do I do next? They brought their friends together. People are faced with chronic illness and are welcomed to the new normal. And they pray. People make great transitions. What they're going to do next is good. But they want to do it right. Lord, guide and direct my steps. So in these times of uncertainty and waiting in transition, pray. And then number two, when confronted with sin or shortcomings, do not back off. Name it and face it. And that action can lead to hope and caring. Now is the time I will connect this passage from Isaiah to what we heard in Luke's gospel. We have the two men there praying. And, and one, that one guy likes to give God his resume as if God did not already know how good he was. It's actually pretty obnoxious. Look how perfect I am. Now it is good that this guy does not swindle people. I'm all for that. It's good that he is not unjust. It is good that he has sexual integrity. And if this guy fasts for the right reasons twice a week, that's a good thing as well as tithing. That's always a good thing. But, and I mean a big but here, does he have to make a production of it? Can he just give thanks for what he is doing well in his life and then confess about what he is not doing well? He's completely trusting this per outwardly perfect resume, but not looking at where he has fallen short. However, the tax collector honestly admits, I have blown it. And if he worked like a typical tax collector, he had taken advantage of people. He had skimmed a little bit off the top for himself. He had lied on his expense report, well, the equivalent for that time and place. And he really was not the kind of guy that you'd want to have as a neighbor, or the kind of man you wanted coaching and influencing your children. But when this man faced, was faced with his stuff, the tax collector, in effect, um, did face it. He could not look towards heaven. He said, Lord, have mercy on me. And that is what brought the attention to Christ. He said, that is what justifies him. Face the true truth for hope for something better. And third, here's another interesting observation. Isaiah followed his call that God gave him. 
But remember, when he went there to the temple, he was not sure what was next. He did know he, knew he needed to pray. And in the midst of that, God called him. In the midst of a time of, what, of uncertainty, he did something of what she was certain. And then God began to answer the uncertainty. As you read along in the story, these several months now, we constantly see this pattern. Abraham is minding Abraham Inc. based in Haran. And God says you need to move the corporate headquarters to the promised land, and he does. Moses is doing his job of tending the sheep, and God calls. Gideon is threshing the wheat in secret. He is called. Boaz is letting a young lady come work in the fields as a gleaner. In the midst of that story, God works. Samuel, as a young boy, is working for Eli, and God calls during the night. David is tending the sheep, and he gets word, you need to come up to the house. He does, and there is Samuel, as a grown man, the prophet and judge, prepared to anoint him as future king. If we do the things we are certain, God will show us the things about which we are uncertain in due time. It may be through um, working with a friend and he says, hey, I need help in coaching my team. Can you help me out? Well, sure. And in the midst of that, you realize I really like coaching. I love the way I can influence positively this group of young people. I think I'm going to do this for a while and call to a new ministry there. Maybe a need in the community. Maybe a need here at church. I mentioned my friend earlier in Kansas City, and uh, he just had, back in the fall, a milestone birthday. I've got one, same number, uh, coming up some months ahead. And so I asked him, as I've asked several men who have passed that mark, guys that I respect, guys that I've known for, for many years now, um, how do you hit that mark strong? What are some good things to do? He sent me back a really helpful email. I want to read this, this small portion of it to you. He wrote, at work, I realize more and more that I'm in the last decade of my career. And my focus has turned more and more to one of a coach or mentor. I don't like the boss tag. How can I help the younger men balance the stress of our job with being a good husband and father? I'm realizing I enjoy this type of mentoring. So doing what he knew he needed to do, discovering a little different take on it, being more of a mentor now. And then this, finally, what to do with all the extra time on your hands. For me, it started when the kids were leaving for college. I knew the next stage of life was starting. I began praying for the Lord's direction with my time and talent, and he led me to Kairos Prison Ministry. This is an unbelievably unbelievable ministry to those who believe they are forgotten and unloved. And I've seen the Holy Spirit work ways I've never seen before in the lives of these inmates. It is truly inspirational. In the midst of that, God called. Now this is our third service today. Our first was at 845 in the chapel. It is traditional and yet casual in a very intimate setting. Ignite at 9 takes place in the fellowship hall, high-tech, modern, contemporary. And here we have full-blown traditional 11 o'clock worship in this magnificent venue. And for many of you, if you envision this story from Isaiah, you're going to place it here. Well, of course, in such a magnificent place as this, God would speak. And God does speak in places like this, don't get me wrong. But realize, too, that God can speak whether in a chapel or a fellowship hall, wherever folks were gathered for worship today, God was speaking to them. Now, I do not know if today you're at a place of uncertainty and transition and waiting for some, this may be some big questions in front of you. For some, it may be small. It may be, now how am I going to get everything done this week that I'm supposed to get done? Some of you have confronted or are confronting a great shortcoming in your life. And some of you are looking for new direction. Again, 
big or small. God will meet you and show you where you are certain in this place at this time as God did earlier today. God is here to meet with you, to confront and to challenge, to comfort and even commission. Yes, here today in the house of the Lord, God is ready, is meeting you. And like Isaiah, will you listen? Amen.